Hi folks, welcome to Misty Mittagong. It's Titus Murray here from Southern Highland Structural Geology. In today's video, we're going to be going through the theory and background of fault seal analysis. Hi folks, back in the office, thinking about how faults seal and going through the sort of processes and, and theory we think about when we're doing our work. Just to be clear, we're thinking about hydrocarbons and fault seal, and we're thinking about hydrocarbon sealing over geologic timescales, so hundreds of thousands of years to millions of years, rather than production timescales. And in our studies, we're trying as much as possible to use open file data so that we can provide the data for you to check what we're doing, and also trying to document our outcrops so that uh, they're up there either as gigapan images or as um, 3D models. Um, from photogrammetry. So in terms of how faults seal and don't seal, <clears throat> we think about fault sealing in a whole range of different ways. Often we want faults to leak, uh, sometimes we want them to seal, sometimes we're concerned about flow up and down the faults. If we think about the expiration time scale uh, or expiration process, um, we, we think about faults leaking early on because we want hydrocarbons to get across faults, we don't want to be in a fault shadow. We want hydrocarbons to move up and migrate through faults until eventually they get to a trap and at the trap they are trapped against the ceiling fault. And then within the trap we don't want too many faults to, to generate compartments so we want all the faults to be leaking within the compartments. In reality faults actually act in this sort of way of being somewhat a seal and or having a low permeability element to them but also having enhanced flow parallel to them. And then the one that often comes across with our consulting work is that faults are uh, often inferred because of f flow responses when there's poor data and or there's some sort of folding. And, and in many cases, these are related to stratigraphic changes. And we've got some really good case studies for that. There's a really nice study that um, Scribic at at, and, and folks have put together, they've looked at effectively the assertions within papers. They haven't looked at the validity of the, the assertions. They've simply said, well, what does this paper talk about? Does it talk about fault leaking or sealing? And they see some really strong differences. In structural geology, there's a, there's a strong um, significance of people talking about sealing faults as opposed to a low significance or low rate of people talking about um, leaking faults. Similarly in oil, there's generally a tendency towards sealing faults as opposed to leaking or the combination features. When you start to look at tunneling and mines and dams, in many cases for the geotechnical work, people are worried about faults leaking. Now there's, there's a good reason for it. They are looking after people's health and safety. They're concerned about f mining into faults or tunnel boring into faults. And ingress into the into the into the workings and health and safety issues and that's really different again from uh, an oil and gas company that might be taking a uh, trying to trying to produce a prospect that that looks attractive because it has a ceiling fault so we're thinking about faults in a whole range of different ways on top of that there's a lot of uncertainty around faults there's uncertainty about the fault geometry so if we just look at this little Mickey Mouse example, we've got ourselves um, something that we might see in the <coughs> Nam Canton or Kulong Basin in Vietnam. We've got a fast basement with you know, 6,000 metres per second. We've got a um, fairly anisotropic um, lacustrine terrestrial environment sitting on top of that. And then we've got a marine succession where the velocities are all nicely well behaved. And so when we're starting to think about seismic, we can see pretty well what's going on in the foot wall. We've got nice clear ray paths. There might be some fault shadow issues, but in general we can see that pretty well. Certainly we can see it a lot better than having a look at the areas close into the hang wall here, where we've, it's very hard to get a ray path down into there and bounce out again without it being significantly attenuated or, or modified by the, the velocity contrasts. The single most important thing I've found in terms of doing fault seal analysis is actually getting sequence stratigraphy and, and making sure that I'm, I'm working with time equivalent units and in particular finding those um, deeper marine sediments that we often find associated with flooding surfaces. A lot of the time we find them from wells <clears throat> and in general we only drill wells on the upthrown side of the fault. We don't drill stratigraphic um, wells on the other side of the fault. You know, It just doesn't happen. 
we can't afford to drill just to work out what might be across the other side. And, and that in that case, we have problems trying to estimate how much thickness change has gone across there. Is there growth? Is there erosion? And you can see my little section here, I've got erosion in the footwall, like you might see on in some of the Brent province in the North Sea. And I've got an inverted growth section in the hang wall here. And those uncertainties need to come across and be combined into our fault mapping and into our fault seal predictions. When we're starting to look at the seismic and we're starting to look for, for facies, it's often hard to see what's going on. Generally, we're looking for reservoirs. And the, the distinction I've been more and more thinking about is that effectively a reservoir is an aquifer with a top seal. We need to have that reservoir seal pair. And, that, and it's hard to see where those reservoir seal pairs are going to be and or where the, the waste zones. Often there's material that wouldn't be a good enough reservoir, but can move hydrocarbons over geologic times. And that's one of the ones that we really spend a lot of time looking for. And we can't see that often in the seismic. Speaking of the seismic, um, you can see we've got a nice set, uh, we've got a cross section through here. We've got nice reflectors in the hang wall, nice reflectors in the foot wall. And then we've got a fault running through the middle of it. Now, there's a big area of uncertainty in here, and the initial interpretation has a very shallow, low-angle fault. It's mechanically impossible, but that was that's the first interpretation. Well, you know, could this be a monocline? And that this is a, a lot of the time we're working with. Well, is it a fault? What's going on here? What what really is the feature we're seeing? And sure enough, when they actually have a look at this, they went through and they worked out that they could actually really nicely fit. A set of terraces in here and this was effectively a set of monoclines. This is an outcrop we're hoping to get you to soon um, on a virtual field trip. This is uh, Penguin Head at Colborough Beach, um, not far from where we, are, where we are. Here we've got a nice flat foot wall and here's the anticline coming down, <coughs> with, sorry the monocline coming down and there's probably a set of faults in here um, which would be these sorts of features you know, the, the, in, in between, which is why it's been eroded by the sea. Think a bit about the parameters we can use to do a fault seal calculation and what we do and don't know about them. And one of the big issues we've got is, do we actually really know things? And determinism is part of that. Galileo, um, one of the forefathers of science, really sat there and thought about things a lot and broke a bunch of ideas. One in particular was whether the Earth went around the sun or the sun went around the Earth. And part of that, he had thought about forces and there were, and looked at how um, gravity worked. And one of the great experiments he did was taking two objects um, of different masses and dropping them from the Leaning Tower of Pisa. As he dropped those two objects, he noticed that they both landed at the ground at the same time, irrespective of their, their mass. This got him in a little bit of a hot water and his mother would say he was a very naughty boy, but nonetheless, what it's useful about this is that we can recreate this experiment. If we went back to Pisa today and corrected for the compaction and the continued tilt in the tower, we would come up with the same results. And a deterministic model is just that. You can repeat it and it will produce the same results each time. When we start to think about geology, geology is generally pretty under constrained. We don't know a lot about what's happened. And so if you give two geologists a bit of information you'll generally get three answers or maybe more but what will happen is we'll anchor on one of those answers what we would argue is that the important thing is to recognize that determinism doesn't work in uh, geologic models and if that's the case then we have to go through stochastic modeling and over the next few lectures you'll see our efforts to try and introduce stochastic modeling into fault seal calculations so the parameters what are the things we need to know? Well, one of the first things we need to know is something about the fault geometry. And we're really lucky that um, a bunch of workers have um, gone and measured the length of faults and looked at displacement. And this gives us a first starting point to start to check our parameters and understand what the uncertainties are. So this really, I use this graph the whole time from Schultz and Fossen in 2002. It's, it's a, a very useful um, diagram. How it's put together is it's a log-log plot, so you have to be a little bit careful. Um, down the bottom left are the small faults and the top right are the big ones. And they put them together and you can do this in your area wherever you're working. Bottom left, we've got the stuff from Outcrop. We've got a diagram here from um, Sylvia De Rossa's paper that I was co-author on and Miri. And we can see that what she's done is she's looked at length and displacements at those 
scales of the outcrop. We then start to think about the intermediate scale. You can see there's another bunch of data. That's come from seismic data. And this is a really nice diagram in that it shows a map, a depth structure contour map across a field in Indonesia. Um, shows the faults, but it also shows the information that went into it. It shows the wells and it shows the 2D seismic. So you've got a sense of how good or bad this interpretation is. This is what we should all be doing, making sure we post our data. Up in the top right section, we start to get the larger faults. This is a bit of a um, geological map from um, uh, the Liverpool Plains, um, where we've got on the right hand side of the diagram we've got the hunter Mokai thrust which is a really big thrust that separates two significant terrains in Australia and then we've got these smaller faults through the Breezer Plains which are, there's a proposed coal mine now those faults have come from seismic outcrop and drilling and they plot back in our, our central area and you can see we've got gaps between the populations of the outcrop seismic and um, large-scale structural geology but nonetheless we can see that we've got systematic changes and we use that all the time to check the validity of our faults and understand the uncertainty around throw, vertical displacement and length. In terms of looking then within the displacement, this is the work from the Fault Analysis Group, originally in uh, Liverpool, now in Dublin. A lot of this was done on coal mines in uh, the Midlands of the UK, of England, sorry. Um, and what's interesting with this is they took really good outcrop observations from the open cast mines and used those to put together a systematic model of how faults dis uh, fault displacement varies. So they came up with, with a really and, and reaffirmed a number of models that people have worked on saying well look if we have a fault it has a central maximum displacement which is in the yellow area in the top right corner and then we've got ourselves um, a displacement that dis diminishes out to the tip, which is the blue area. So what we're seeing in those those bullseye diagrams are contours of throw. The solid line is my foot wall. The downthrown dotted line is my hang wall. And we've got a systematic central maximum displacement diminishing off to the edges. In the blue areas, we see these parabolic or upside down bow shaped geometries. And this is, I think, is a really fundamental geometry for us to th start to think about. And what we're doing is we're taking the three-dimensional geometry of the fault and starting to look at the displacement variation. And where this becomes really useful is trying to understand how faults link. And again, the Fault Analysis Group have been fantastic at putting together some really nice models on how faults link over time. So you can have two central maximum displacements as, as faults coalesce and then keep propagating. And what happens then is you end up with this double bowed um, throw profile. So we use throw profiles the whole time. And it's, they're, they're easy to do and use generally, it's all about counting contours. Even though faults are the most important thing in terms of fault seal analysis, I would actually sit there and say, well, you know, stratigraphic variability is, is right up there. In fact, if I want to do a really good fault seal analysis, I'm getting a sequence stratigraphy and rather than a structural geologist like myself is that I think is the first pass. So fundamentally <clears throat> in oil and gas uh, we have aquifers and aquitards. Uh, in hydrogeology we have aquifers and aquitards. If we see pressure differences in our aquifers then we know we have different uh, we have an aquitard between that we are separating pressures. We're that that seal unit or aquitard unit is a, is attenuating pressure between two aquifers, and the fundamental definition of a of reservoir is well, it's an aquifer that's got hydrocarbons in it. So when we start to think about aquifers having hydrocarbons in them, well, that really means we need to have a top seal. So the very first thing we need to understand is where are our seals or aquitards, and where have we got aquifers underneath them. So we tend to segment our stratigraphy when we're doing a fault seal analysis to simplify things into seals and reservoirs. I can only have a reservoir if I've got a seal on top of me. Now I can have reservoir quality rocks or I can have rocks that are um, lesser quality that may not be able to produce from but still allow hydrocarbons to move and they would be thief or waste zones. So we segment our stratigraphy into thief zones, seals and reservoirs. It's a very, you know, subje to a certain extent, it's subjective, but if we deal with it probabilistically, we can actually get away with a lot of this. Um, but really, where we like, rely strongly on this is sequence stratigraphy, because those seals aren't there randomly. 
And one of the things that we think about a lot is where have we got transgressive systems tracks? Um, so this is part of this is a, a famous diagram from the brain sequence, and what it shows in, in particular is that we've got a delta, a delta of the brain sequence prograding out into the Viking Graben, and we've got a set of sands at the bottom, which is the Rannoch and Etiv. Um, as the sea level changes, um, we then start to get the delta prograding. And out the front of that, we have shore face sands. And each of these Tarbot sands and Hugen sands are shore face sands. Now, they get called the same name. They're all called the Tarbot sand, and they all sit in the same depositional environment, but they are not time equivalent. And you can see from these geometries that many of them, they have got lacustrine green sediments uh, up dip of them that provide a potential seal, and they're overlain by. Um, marine shales. And this is the marine shales is where I'm really looking for good top seals. There's some really nice um, YouTubes uh, about sequence stratigraphy. Um, I've just come across Jennifer Lewis's work. She's a she's a, a, an educator at, at university and just does it with a pencil and paper and similar with some of the SEPM lectures. They go through how sequence stratigraphy works so that even me as a structural geologist can understand. So I highly recommend them. So Bringing that together, what we need is a diagram, a tool um, to, to pull our fault information, our stratigraphy broken down into whether it's a seal or a, a, an aqua, a reservoir. And the fundamental and most important paper, I would argue, in fault seal analysis is Allen's paper in 1989. And where he, in there he says, well, faults are neither a seal or a conduit. You know, he's pretty straightforward, and this is in his abstract. And what, what Allen's method consists of if we take our um, British coal example, or just as any uh, of the geometry, there we've got um, our trap potentially with the upthrown side um, with, at 80 meters going down to 110, sorry, 80 feet going down to 110 feet. And our red line there represents the football trace. And we just digitize, trace that football trace. You can do this with paper, pencil and paper. And Alan did all his stuff with pencil and paper. You can let that gets us that red line. And that red line is an unfolded or long section along the fault plane. And we're going to produce a cross section along the fault plane. It's not complicated, but you need a bit of a tolerance to boredom. And you need to sit there and slowly think about it. And often I find pencil and paper and, and, and colouring in really helps you understand things. Please, please, please do not use these to bamboozle your co-workers. They, you can do that but nobody will respect you. Having got my foot wall sorted out, I can then lay in my stratigraphy. And here we're just measuring our stratigraphy, our thicknesses. So I've got an A reservoir and a B reservoir, and that's the A and B reservoir in the foot wall. We then start to think about, well, what's happening on the other side? So that's on the, the other side of the screen, on your side of the screen, my side of the screen. We can then draw in the hang wall. That's the dotted line. And where, again, we just trace the contours on the foot wall side, on the hang wall side of the fault, the downthrown side of the fault. Now, this might seem a bit like train spotting, we're counting contours, but you know this is a useful skill. You can do it on any map, provided it's posted and has a scale. So therefore, we've, we've, that gives us our downthrown side. From that, we can then similarly go and paste in our stratigraphy, and we overlay our stratigraphy. I tend only to put the aquifers or reservoirs in place. Um, because if I'm happy that's a seal, then I don't need to color in. What are my functional arrangements I'm looking for is aquifer against aquifer, or reservoir against reservoir. So what we can see now is we've got A in the foot wall on the other side of the screen, A in the hang wall on this side of the screen, B on the hang wall, B in the foot wall. With that, what we're interested in, and this is where the boring, annoying bit, this is a bit like looking at the wiring diagram to fix your car or doing your tax return you need to go through and start to think about what that means. Now, you could use a bunch of cross-sections, and cross-sections can be informative and can be helpful. What you can see from this is that the B reservoir at the center of maximum displacement juxtaposes the number one top seal. No problem at all, all hunky-dory. If we start to move across to the tips of the fault, you can see that that B in the foot wall starts to juxtapose the A in the hang wall. Now, this is where we've got to start to work out what's going on. Now, we can produce a set of serial sections, but you're always going to have problems integrating between them. And this is why the Allen map, I think, is really useful. And you certainly cannot do this from a single one-dimensional triangle plot. 
you actually need to build your Allen maps. And what we've done is we've said, okay, here's the area of your exposition. And when we start to look at what Alan says in his in his abstract and the dot dot dots um, in there, they're slightly abridging this. Yeah, a fault is neither a seal or a conduit, and depends on the strata juxtaposed by the fault. What we can see in here is those blue diamonds are our areas of juxtaposition of the A and B. And if we start to think about where our hydrocarbons would be, what Alan would suggest is that we can end up with a reasonably large column in the A in the foot wall because it's only de defined by self juxtaposition and we can end up with a much smaller column in B because of juxtaposition of A in the hang wall. Now, so a fault is neither a seal or a conduit, therefore the effects of faulting on both migration and entrapment depend on the strata juxtaposed by the fault. So really what he's talking about here is basin modeling and fault seal analysis. And I think it's really important for us to, to, when we're doing our analysis, to do this simple bit of geometry. They're complicated to, to read, but they're simple to make. We thought a lot about how ge uh, geometry can affect uh, juxtaposition and fault seal. We're going to now think about and discuss some of the ideas of membrane seal. As you remember from our different models, membrane seal um, is a mechanism to try and stop fault flow moving across the fault, laterally across the fault. And the most common algorithm that's been used uh, for invoking membrane seal is shell gouge ratio. And what we're doing here is in in the algorithm is looking at grain reduction effects, um, sorting um, abrasion of minerals so that we get a clay rich gouge or fault core that's contiguous across a, ju a juxtaposition window that stops flow from one reservoir to another or one aquifer to another. The algorithms are, f or, uh, there's a range of algorithms, clay smear potential, shale smear factor and shale gouge ratio, and all of them are based around integrating throw and some averaging technique for the thickness of clay uh, within the, um, within a section. So clay, uh, the sh fault, so the shale gouge ratio algorithm works by averaging the thickness of each unit with the volume of shale within each unit or volume of clay as some workers put it and then saying well of the materials moved past any point on the foot wall how much of it was clay was it 20 percent 30 percent 50 percent and then the idea coming up with some uh, with some threshold to say well we now have contiguous smear Want, and many workers suggest 20 percent once we get that 20 percent then we can look at the seal potential so the seal potential is its capillary seal capacity or a cross fault pressure difference. Now um, it's vital that you actually make Allen maps and do the, the shale gouge ratio calculation on Allen maps. You cannot do this in a one dimensional sense and you certainly and you, it isn't a, a single point on a fault. So you need to map out the shale gouge ratio across each of the juxtaposition windows. Where this is important, as you can see here, is we've got ourselves um, the yellow unit is down thrown, and we've got a potential um, reservoir um, juxtaposed against um, the black reservoir. And we've got a set of arrows there representing the seal capacity or, um, for a number of points on the fault. So the strongest SGR is at the top, and we've got a big long column that it can support. It's got a large amount of seal capacity, but it isn't going to control the fluid contact. We've got another black arrow which is sh which is shorter and it's the smallest um, seal capacity and it's down at the bottom of the trap but still because of its geographic position it won't control the fluid contact it'll be the red arrow that's the one the red seal capacity that's the important one it's somewhere in the middle of the fault and it's got an intermediate seal capacity and that is then what would control the fluid contact I guess the thing that I'm trying to get people to understand is that in I feel in reality that green arrow is the one we should be worried about. Where's the highest reservoir reservoir juxtaposition? Um, and that's that's the caveat on it. And we'll go through a set of um, case studies um, using public domain data over the next wee while to explore the, and look at those. So based on writing the software and starting to do field training courses and starting to have a look at some of these things out crop, um, one of the places we went to was Miri in Sarawak, north coast of Borneo. There's a famous set of outcrops there at, um, uh, on the airport road. Um, and this is a strike section along one of the faults. So most, most normally when you look at um, the airport road outcrops, you see a really nice dip section. You see the faults displacing. What we're looking at here is a terrace on top of the quarry. 
Um, the important thing about this is that we're, we're seeing the lateral variability of the fault rocks. So my sunglasses are sitting there in the foot wall and then and that's the upthrown side and then the, the the obvious lineament is the fault and that then drops down to be a normal fault with eight, five to ten meters throw dropping down across the fault so that across the, the line is the hang wall the downthrown side and you can see in there there's a range of fault rocks now I've gone and photographed this using Gigapan so you can go in and zoom in and actually look at these things and see see whether you see whether you uh, like what I'm saying or not so we've actually put that data out there so you can see what we've seen now if we have a look in near the sunglasses we've got ourselves a really nice big fat thick fault rock um, but then when we zoom in between the two sets of fault rock you can see we've actually got little or no fault rock and in fact we've got fractures cross-cutting these fractures are stained with um, present-day meteoric um, iron rich water and you can see that these fractures are flowing in and around the fault zone so even though we've got a really good potential gouge in there the thing that's going to control the fluid fluid flow across this um, and this is an important way to think about it, is that lateral variability the thing that's going to control it are the holes it's not how thick it is it's how thin it is when we start to think about how the algorithms work they're all based on the concept of having uh, an averaging or integration of the volume of clay that's moved past any one point on the fault so using throw and uh, variation of stratigraphy well between these points between the 15 20 centimeters where we've got nice thick fault rock and we've got no fault rock I'd argue we've got exactly the same throw and we've got exactly the same stratigraphy in the scheme of things and the algorithms would predict exactly the same fault rock thickness and this is patently not the case in later um, set of lectures, we'll go through and um, show some of the work that Sylvia De Rosa has done on a ne nearby outcrop on uh, Jalan um, uh, at Sunlight Gardens, um, and we can see the where she's gone through and looked at this systematically. So, <clears throat> in conclusion, it's important. I think it's important to think and, and take on board that the, the key controls on fluid contacts are going to be the geometry and interplay between displacement and stratigraphic seal thickness, respective of whether you um, want to use gouge or not. Um, but fundamentally, uh, the displacement and the stratigraphy are what drives all these fault seal calculations. Uh, but we and we we have uncertainty on these, um, but it's we can recognize that we actually do have systematic models and we can actually look in the outcrop and sometimes that outcrop is a piece of uh, sidewalk or um, a piece of concrete um, in a car park we can actually have a look at how these things and give us mental models so that uncertainty is really important and that's why we really need to put in stochastic modeling the outcrop studies are showing their holes in the fault rock systematic strike the um, strike mapping of faults is showing a large amount of variability in faults um, and so that's why we'd, we'd urge a lot of caution about trying to use sort of membrane the membrane seal algorithms so we will be going through um, a range of um, more of these case studies um, and uh, some of the field work in the coming weeks hi folks i hope you found this video useful and interesting as we said this is the first of a series of videos going through case studies. We're also hoping to take you out into the Australian bush and get to see some of the rocks that we are lucky enough to get to play with. See you soon.